We have done many challenges on this channel, and today we will be playing The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time in a most unorthodox way. We will be taking an oath to support our local clay makers as much as we can, spending hundreds of thousands of rupees on clay pots which we have made our chosen weapon. Some say that even swords of legend are nothing without the right hand to wield them, so maybe these pots just need a hero to give them a chance. Hey there friendos, Dubon Killik here, welcoming you back to another awesome Zelda-related challenge. Now, today we're going to be doing the pot-only challenge, which means pretty much if we're going to deal damage to an enemy, we have to use a pot. Can it even be done? Is it even possible? Let's find out. Luckily, we have been equipped with the latest in cutting-edge ceramic technology, allowing us to pull an infinite amount of pots from, uh, this area? Whenever we like? Don't really want to know where the pots are coming from. Shoutouts to Agikare, sorry if I said that incorrectly, for working on the mod for me, and Swankybox for the original idea. Since this is pretty much a combat challenge, we'll be focusing mostly on the mini-bosses, bosses, and certain problematic enemies that come up throughout the run. And of course, the Water Temple, because... Of course, the Water Temple is a huge problem. With that in mind, we will be walking through a bit in the beginning to get the general feel for gameplay, and then things will speed up significantly. With hope in our eyes, we set out on our quest to beat the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. However, this time we were only allowed to damage enemies with our legendary pots. Nearing the Deku Tree after collecting the completely useless Kokiri Sword and the extremely useful Deku Shield, we are already confronted with a pretty big flaw with our new weapon. Pots do extremely inconsistent damage. Some things take damage equal to pretty much the Master Sword, so in the beginning it's actually a damage buff, but some things don't take any damage at all, and other things they just kind of bounce off. They literally don't even interact with the hitbox of the enemy. This does not bode well for us. 100% of the enemies that we've faced so far are immune to pots. Luckily, most enemies do take considerable damage from pots when thrown from a distance, which will be our main method of attacking throughout our quest, along with a secret pot-wielding technique that will be mastered a little ways into our adventure. Oh, and we can also make a wall of pots that can block enemies, but it's really situational and pretty janky. Still, it's nice to take a break and play a little bit of Minecraft in the middle of a Wolfos fight. With discipline, spacing, and patience, everything in the Deku Tree can be completed. We've decided that we're allowed to use defensive actions like shielding, which will allow us to deflect the Deku Nut back at the Deku Scrubs, allowing us to input the classic code of 23 is number one. Moving forward to Goma, she is a rude awakening as to just how janky and precise some of these fights are going to be. It was at this point that the rules of the challenge were starting to be finalized. Admittedly, I wasn't even going to make this run the actual run, but it just kind of ended up happening. This was going to be more of a test run, but we decided to run with it and decided to rule that because most bosses have an attack phase and a damage phase, that only the attack phase when we're actually doing damage to them would count towards failing our challenge. This is usually caused by something stunning the boss and putting them into this vulnerable state, such as a slingshot pellet with Goma or using the hammer on Volvagia. With this in mind, stunning Goma is fairly trivial. However, the spacing on the throws when you're actually trying to hit her eye needs to be absolutely perfect. And I legitimately do mean perfect. Goma is manageable but will require plenty of patience and spacing, something that would ring true for the rest of the challenge. Bringing Goma's HP to zero, we can move on with zero failures to our name as well. Moving forward just a bit to the Sacred Forest Meadow, we are met with one of the toughest enemies in the entire run, already. And that would be the Wolfos. Their tails are their weak points, and they're very weak on the tails, however they block most attacks from the front and move around a lot. This is honestly a complete disaster for this challenge. I mean, sometimes they happen to run their tail into your pot, but this is super inconsistent. This enemy almost cost us to fail the run here and now, but someone in chat mentioned a pretty big brain strat that you could shield drop a pot while holding it over your head and it might still do damage. It was a pretty difficult skill to learn as the hitbox is very small, but it would become one of our main methods of dealing with enemies that like to close the distance on us, which is pretty much all of them. Moving forward to Dodongo's Cavern, there isn't much to talk about here. The most challenging part would be the Lizalfos fight, but those are actually pretty trivial. They're tall enough that we can just throw pots directly into their face. Moving to King Dodongo, he's a total pushover. If Goma was a skillful test in patience and perfect spacing, King Dodongo is a test in trying to stay awake. Throw a bomb in his mouth to stun him, smack him with a pot, easy clap. 
meaning that we've completed the first two levels without a single failure. Now, you'll notice that I keep saying without a single failure under our belt, and that would be because by the end of the challenge, we would decide to just live with a couple failures. As we're only allowed to use pots for combat purposes, there's really no way to defeat the parasitic tentacles without using the boomerang. Given this is the only way that you can damage them, we decided to count these as failures. So we would technically fail this challenge inside of Jabu Jabu's belly. However, we decided to keep going with the run and see if there were any other problematic areas. This would actually end up being the most problematic area in the entire run. I decided to secretly set a bit of a mini challenge and try to keep our total number of failures below 30. I'm sure you've noticed the tracker in the top left corner. I'll refer to these as Fs, in chat of course, for time's sake, and they'll be used to keep track of how many times we have to damage an enemy using anything other than a pot. Keep in mind that this is per action, so a spin attack could hit multiple enemies, but as long as it's only one input, it only counts as one F. As I referenced earlier, the parasitic tentacles in Lord Jabu Jabu's belly are a huge problem. They can only be damaged with a boomerang, and they would end up costing us 12 failures between the three tentacles. After this challenge, I actually learned of a way that we could potentially skip all of these parasitic tentacles, so maybe in a future run we'll be able to knock 12 off of our total counter, which I am pretty excited to get to try. The mini boss of the area, the Big Octo, is easy enough if you know the cheese. Just hit him with the boomerang and wait for him to spin, then stun him again. His back hitbox is actually huge, almost the entirety of his backside, so you don't even have to be very precise. Skipping forward to Barnate, a fairly difficult fight casually, kind of a complete joke with pots. Honestly, the hardest part is hitting the little jellyfish creatures, otherwise, Barbonade is hilariously weak to pots. Just stun him with the boomerang and machine gun pots until he explodes, allowing us to complete Lord Jabba Jabba's belly with a harsh 12 failures. Obtaining the hookshot and entering the forest temple, we encounter a pretty interesting bug that can apparently happen very rarely when you use pots on wolfos that would allow them to die but not die. Eventually, we just decide to skip these wolfos and can head to our first Stalfos room, enemies that we unfortunately can't skip. And it, uh, didn't go well. The second Stalfos fight went only slightly better. You see, while we did have a plan going in, which is pretty much just throw our entire inventory of Dekunets at them, the second set of Stalfos must be destroyed within a few seconds of one another, or else the first one will reform. This means that we have to keep in mind not only our spacing, the position of the second Stalfos and our Dekunut count, but also how many times we've hit both of them. Eventually, after yet another death, we managed to get the bow, but it was not a smooth experience at all. And you know, there's somewhere else where we have to do this, but I can't quite remember exactly where it is. Whatever it is, I'm sure it won't come back to bite us in the butt later. Honestly, the Poe sisters are completely trivial compared to that disaster, with the exception of the purple Poe sister. You see, the purple Poe sister will copy themselves and circle Link at a very specific distance, which is too far away to drop a pot on them and too close to hit them with a standard throw. We were really, really pressed for options here. I wasn't sure what to do, but luckily, Sage of Games in Twitch chat came in with the clutch galaxy brain play. Instead of moving the pot into the sister, move the sister into the pot. Which was just something I'd never even considered, but sure enough, if we threw the pot and skillfully move the real post sister into the pot's trajectory, she'll take damage. As the post sister falls, we managed to make it all the way to Phantom Ganon without adding a single failure to our tally. Phantom Ganon, unfortunately, would prove to be the first boss that is not possible with only pots. It's really hard to tell if he's actually being damaged during the first phase because it doesn't follow the standard stun and attack flow that most of the bosses have. We decided to count these. He's not being stunned at any point during whenever he's riding the horse. He just kind of goes into phase two. Our burden is made heavier, needing to carry an additional three failures to get him off of his horse. Phase two is fairly vanilla. Just hit the orbs back at him, which is something that I'm not particularly good at, and then throw pots at him until he's defeated, allowing us to to leave the forest temple with a heavy stack of 15 Fs. We are just about halfway through the game, so this challenge seems somewhat reasonable. Things in the fire temple are fairly manageable. The real enemy in this temple is not who you might think. 
You might think it'd be the Flare Dancer mini-bosses, and yeah, those are really tricky and very time-consuming. However, they're pretty much harmless as long as you keep up on their fire form. This is where pot dropping comes in really handy. The gameplay in the back should showcase just how awkward this fight is, but it's perfectly possible. Then maybe it's Volvagia. Well, no, actually. The real enemy of the Fire Temple are the little fire slugs. They are completely immune to damage from pots. Sure, you can use the hammer to flip them over like a molten pancake. Looking tasty. They're, they're not. That's gross. Ew. Oh, they don't even look good in HD. Ah, they look worse in HD. But even flipped over, they take absolutely no damage. This is a massive problem as the room just before the boss key holds four of these guys and a handful of keys. Keys, of course, being another annoying enemy to deal with using pots, but I mean, they're small flying creatures, so of course they are. I don't really feel like I need to bring that up, but they are, so yeah. It pains me, but we had to add a total of six failures in this room, bringing our grand total up to 21. A whole six Fs in just this one room. And sure, you could likely get the slug stacked up a little bit better, but if you try to flip just one over with the hammer, you risk flipping all of the others over as well, and it's just this huge ordeal. Volvagi is a bit tricky, but can be stunned with the hammer and smashed with pots repeatedly. Aside from that, you can also spam pots while they're in the air for even more damage. Don't get me wrong, this fight can be extremely tedious, but as long as you hang off the side to avoid the rockfall damage, play it carefully around their fire breath, not that big of a deal. This would most likely be the longest and most boring boss fight in this entire challenge, but at least we're rewarded with an interesting interaction during their defeat cutscene. <laughs> He's like, oh shit, that could have hit me and drops his pot. As we prepare for the end game, we are ready to head to the ice cavern and get the iron boots. With a total of 21 failures so far and a goal of less than 30, it's not looking good. The ice cavern is another place that we will unfortunately have to take a failure, and not just one, but two. I know this seems really silly, but the freezers in this area are immune to pots for some reason. I mean, they're literally made of ice, but take no damage from blunt force trauma. Whatever, just use Din's fire in the right spots and you can clear up this area in just two casts, bringing our total count up to 23. Honestly, there's not much else to mention here. The area is a pain, but it can be done with a bit of patience. At this point, we have honed our skills to a fine razor's edge, and not even the Wolfos was proving to be much of a challenge anymore. Next, we decided to go to the bottom of the well, which I'm including because I know people are going to be curious about Dead Hand. Absolutely a joke. He is very, very weak to pots. I cannot emphasize enough how weak Dead Hand is to pots. The arc of the pot lines up perfectly with his head and just decimates him, making one of the scariest bosses in the game a complete joke. Heading into the Water Temple, you know how I feel about this area. And as you might imagine, we're looking at a lot of failures here. And the main issue is that our pots just shatter underwater. Now this poses a huge issue as one of the keys we need to progress requires us to defeat about seven enemies to get it. Given that they are all underwater, our only option to combat them would be to use the hook shot. So that's seven failures right there for one single key. Given that that would legitimately end our challenge right then and there, we have 23, We'd have to take seven, but I had a better idea. You see, I have been dabbling a little bit in the Ocarina of Time glitches for quite a while now, and I knew of a handful of glitches that might help us avoid getting that one problematic key. We would need to take a single F to get the key in the Shell Blade room, but this can be done with a single Din's Fire, giving us a total count of 24. Next, we would normally get the key in the middle pillar under the water, but what if we could skip this key altogether? So we set out on the long process to do so, and I can assure you it was quite a doozy. This would require a lot of quick saves and is fairly complex, but it would be worth it to skip the seven failures we would have had to take in otherwise. If you move the water to the second level and save warp back to the beginning of the level, you can mega flip onto the center pillar. This will put us on the third level of the center pillar. From there, you can just 
barely hit the eye switch. This seems pretty close to be pixel perfect, by the way. From there, you have just enough time to run in, grab the key just before the gate closes. This will allow us to have a key that we're only supposed to have after we get the long shot. However, we're not done yet. One wrong move and we could easily soft lock ourselves in this temple, or at least lock ourselves into having to go grab that key and failing the challenge. We would need to decide which door we want to skip in order to keep the soft lock from happening. We decide that we can skip the key door that leads to the plaque that lets you raise the water level to the top. Save warp back to the beginning of the level and perform another mega flip to the third level of the middle pillar. From here, we try to use the scarecrow song to allow us to use the plaque, but for some reason it just wasn't working. I'm guessing maybe it has something to do with making sure that you've actually used the key on the door down below. Luckily, we found an exploit that would allow Link to get there himself with a super janky jump slash allowing us to raise the water level to the third area. Wow, that was an extremely long-winded explanation and a wall of text, which my dyslexia hates. It's okay. The wall of text and scripting can't hurt you anymore, newborn Keelik. Getting back on track, we can continue the temple, quote-unquote as intended, for the second half. Now, Dark Link is quite a tricky one, but we can use an exploit with Dark Link's AI to make him completely passive. Throwing a Deku Nut at him while he's slightly off-screen will stun him. If you don't hit him and wait for the stun to wear off, he will put his sword away and just become your friend. Not really sure why that works, but we take those. This would give us all the time we need to work around this battle. Make no mistake, without this exploit, this fight would be a huge issue. It's very, very difficult to hit Dark Link even in this passive state. Imagine if he's just wailing on you with his sword the entire time. You're in for a bad time. The rest of the temple is fairly vanilla, except for the fact I forgot to obtain the key on the second floor where you meet Rudo. Yeah, I should have done that while I had the water on the second level, huh? Naturally, we can't use bombs underwater, and I don't want to do all that mega flip nonsense again, so we just had to find a more creative solution. Nice. With the final key obtained, we are ready for Morpha, who is surprisingly a chump, actually. Hitting the amoeba with the pot is tricky, since you'll almost always take damage if you hookshot it out. However, if you just spam pots while it's jumping around in the water, it actually takes a ton of damage very easily. 24 tallies on the list and the last two temples in the game to go, our challenge of keeping it under 30 was not looking good. Skipping to the child section of the spirit temple, yes, I always do the spirit temple before the shadow temple. Apparently that's weird. Apparently most people do the shadow temple first, but that's just how I do it. How do you do it? Actually, I'm genuinely curious. Do you do it? Shadow Temple and then Spirit Temple, or Spirit and then Shadow. But anyway, here we have our next failure on the Armos needed to open up the doors to obtain the key. This will actually be our only failure on the child side of the temple, surprisingly enough. You might think that the Iron Knuckle is going to be a challenge, but as it turns out, they're also very weak to pots. And as long as you keep your distance, there's very little they can actually do. Obtain the Silver Gauntlets and move on to the Adult section. Throughout the rest of the Shadow Temple and the Spirit Temple, there will only be one more failure, and it's on this damned Beemos that we have to defeat to open the barred doors leading up to the room with the shifting walls, giving us a total of 26 and only 4 away from our inevitable failure. When it comes to Twin Rova, Chad and I had a bit of discussion as to whether reflecting the beam back of the Twin Rova sisters would count or not, but eventually we decided that they do not count as they are the ones using the attack. And we have been able to defend ourselves however we choose, with our shield, just like with the various Deku scrubs in the Deku tree. Anyway, Twin Rova hits us with a wink and we hit them with multiple pots to the face. The arc of the pots, ironically, is actually pretty perfect to hit them without even having to close the gap, so quite trivial, pretty much vanilla. Moving forward to the Shadow Temple, you might be very curious how we can actually make it all the way through the Shadow Temple without a single failure. And while it is true that there are a ton of enemies in the Shadow Temple, most of them are avoidable. And the others are generally pretty slow, except for those damned keys. They're always a problem. But moving on to Bongo Bongo, oh boy, where do I start? He moves all over the place, he has powerful attacks, and he has a ton of health. And he's just super weak to spamming B. He just gets annihilated by it. As it turns out, 
You can just throw pots at his hands, and whenever he comes in for an attack, just throw pots at him. All of these will stun him. Yes, he would be the most difficult boss in the game to do pot only, as he does a lot of damage, and he has some attacks that are completely unblockable, such as the giant fist. But overall, this is more just to say that the other bosses are hilariously weak to pots, which is a trend that we kind of noticed throughout this entire challenge. Moving on to Ganon's castle, I'm going to be honest with you, there's nothing in this area that we haven't had to deal with already. We would have to use Din's fire in the Trial of Ice to defeat the Freezers, but that is it. The rest of the trials and the trek up to Ganondorf himself can all be done using pots only. Sure, it's not easy, mind you, but it can be done. Our count heading into the fight with Ganondorf would be 27. 27 failures in this challenge. 27 times that we had to use something other than a pot to damage an enemy. Everything had led up to this. Swanky Box's video on this fight was what inspired this entire challenge. It was a difficult battle, but our setup was a little different than Swanky Box's. We had the power of pots at will, and could summon forth our weapon of choice at our command, and with enough patience, we dropped enough pots on Ganondorf's head until his skull caved in tower escape sequence, you might remember there was a little bit of a foreshadowing that we had to do earlier. We have to fight two of the Stalfos again. It went poorly. I was really starting to debate whether this was possible or not. I mean, we have to defeat two of these special Stalfos. Again, they need to be defeated in quick succession. We only have three minutes to descend the entirety of the castle with two of the most difficult enemies in our challenge. Even with Deku Nuts, this would take a couple tries. But eventually, we did it. Moving on to the final confrontation with the hulking behemoth that is Ganon. There is no way that our puny pots will be able to damage the beast. Well, actually they do. All we would need to do is Z-lock and run under his legs and jam pots into his tail until he falls. The second phase is a little bit more difficult. Our strategy is just a little bit less consistent, but still works like a charm. All things considered, this would pretty much be a victory lap, except no matter how many times I hit Ganon with pots during the second phase, he just wouldn't go down. We even tried quick saving and hitting him once with the Master Sword just to see how close we were. Every time we were one hit away with the Master Sword, but the pots just wouldn't get it done. Eventually, we did have to use the Master Sword. I'm really not sure why Swanky Box was able to down him with the pots, and I wasn't able to. Maybe it was a version thing. And this is it. We had Ganon right where we wanted him. It was time to end this. Unfortunately, standard clay pots are not really on par with a legendary blade of evil's bane, and Ganon's plot armor keeps him from being defeated by our chosen weapon, adding a total of two failures to the challenge, one for actually downing Ganon, and another for the final blow. And that was it. We completed the vast majority of the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time using only pots to deal damage to enemies. Hello everybody, if you're interested in seeing more challenges similar to this on Ocarina of Time or other Zelda games, please subscribe to the channel and check us out on twitch.tv slash newbornkeelik where we live stream these challenges for all to enjoy. Thank you to all my patrons and channel supporters for all of your support. If you want your wonderful name to show up here, please do consider pledging on Patreon or becoming a channel member here on YouTube. Anyway, I'm Newborn Keelik and I'll see you in the next one. I'm out.